Welcome to the European Central Bank podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Michael Steen, and in this episode, we'll be talking about inflation. This is the measure of the increase in prices of goods and services over time, and it is the key thing that most central banks look at. A bit like Goldilocks in the fairy tale finding bear's porridge that is neither too hot nor too cold, globally, central banks want to find a balance on inflation. There should be a little, but definitely not too much. And whereas in the 1970s it seemed that there was definitely far too much inflation, these days economists are puzzling over why inflation has been so low, and at times even too low. So in this episode we wanted to explore this topic. Why should prices go up? What drives inflation? And what does the ECB do to keep prices stable? My first guest today is ECB Executive Board Member and Chief Economist Philip R. Lane. Philip, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Can we start with just a very basic definition of inflation? What it means is how much prices over time go up. So if you like, if you think about the euro in your pocket today, how much you can buy with one euro today is quite different to 20 years ago when the euro started. So we're okay with prices going up a little bit every year. In fact, If prices did not go up a little bit every year, it causes its own problems. And maybe we can come back to that. Um, But equally, it really is uh, damaging to the economy. It's damaging to families. It's damaging to corporations if inflation goes up too quickly. So, as you say, it's it's to to strike the balance. Uh, The world history tells us many episodes where too high inflation has been very damaging. Uh, What we face right now is the challenge of inflation that is too low. And it's it's really an interesting time to work in a central bank because I think uh, we more or less know how to fix inflation that is too high. Uh, Fixing inflation that is too low brings its own new challenges. Okay, so let's talk about the, the too low challenge a little bit. I mean, I think it's counterintuitive for lots of people. You know, people would think, well, prices are not going up. That's good, isn't it? It is uh, definitely good news for, as of today, so if you took a snapshot today and you ask someone, which do you prefer? Do you prefer prices to be flat or even falling, or do you prefer prices to go up? Of course, the answer is you prefer prices to be flat or falling. But when you take into account the whole economy, and we take into account what happens over time, then it becomes a problem. Let's take your typical worker. Uh, There's a deep connection between uh, what's happening to prices and what's happening to wages. So if you rephrase that question and said, I'm going to tell you that your wage is going to go up more slowly over time. What's going to be your attitude? So I'm not so happy about that. No more pay rises. (laughs) Uh, Well, you know, with with the economy getting more productive over time, there would be wage rises. But but there is, um, uh, I, I think, a problem, which is there you know, in the end, when we get to it, why do we want inflation to be closer towards two and not stuck at one or even falling towards zero? Uh, Why we want that is it, if if you like uh, to use a phrase, it provides some oil in the economy, some lubricant. If you have a system where everyone is expecting prices to go up a little bit every year, then it, it turns out, I mean, this is the historical evidence, it turns out the economy moves more smoothly. And in particular, and this is really, I think, the most important issue is, let's say uh, some bad news arrives. Let's say there's a recession in the future. If going into that recession, you have inflation where it should be in the neighborhood of 2%, then what that means is the ability of us as the European Central Bank to stabilize the economy, to stabilize prices when there's a negative shock is so much greater than if inflation were stuck at one or zero. So it really provides the resilience in the economy. It allows the ECB to provide a guarantee of stability. This is very much a stability oriented uh, central bank. And for that stability, the paradox maybe is you don't want to stabilize around zero, you want to stabilize around a number more or less 2%. By the way, every central bank in the world has reached the same, same conclusion. At uh, 2% is the target for the Federal Reserve, the People's Bank of China, Bank of Canada, Bank of England. Everywhere, 
there's a strong consensus on this. The ECB formulation is close to but below 2%, but that's ballpark very similar. I see. So, I mean, and as you say, there is this, this huge global uh, consensus around the 2% figure. There's, although there's also been a bit of debate, hasn't there, about some people saying, shouldn't it be more? Some people, particularly here where we are at the moment in Germany, saying, shouldn't it be less? Maybe just tease out that point again on if it was lower, what, what is it that, that and the, and the central bank faces a shock? How is the central, central bank then um, constrained in how it can act? So one of the strongest uh, laws of economics is the direct connection between inflation and interest rates. So if you have a world where inflation is hovering around two, the, and let's say underneath that in terms of the underlying real performance of the economy, what we call the real rate of interest is also, let's say, two. Put that together, uh, then you would have our policy rate, the ECB rate, around four. So if in good times you have an interest rate at four, then when a, a bad shock happens, you can imagine we can do a lot of uh, monetary accommodation. We can cut the interest rate from four all the way down close to zero. If instead you start where, where inflation is at zero, even if the underlying economy is similar, then the peak interest rate is at two and your ability to fight a, a down negative shock is so much less. So a, again, it's a very interesting issue because of course, as of today, you know, uh, is it a big problem to have inflation at one? Uh, it's not a problem as of today, but it does mean if there's a, a problem, a, a, a negative shock in the future, a slowdown in the future, we would be less effective. And another aspect is, of course, that in terms of where we're, when we're looking at our inflation objective, we, we talk famously of this medium term. So it's not what, what inflation is right now. We're looking ahead a little bit. Can you explain why is that element important? So the, I think uh, there's two elements to that. One is, um, again, it, it's very solidly founded in evidence that the our monetary policy decisions take a while to hit the economy because essentially we are changing conditions in the financial markets. Uh, you or I are not directly <laughs> trading in terms of the financial market. So what we have to rely on is how the banks on those markets convert um, the financial conditions they see in the money market into your mortgage rate, your rate for a car loan, at uh, the rate of lending to a small and medium enterprise and so on. So all of that takes time. And then in turn, a firm may have a decision process. It may take a number of months to say, OK, we we see these lending rates are lower. Uh, let's make a plan to do more investment. That takes time. A consumer uh, may take time to say, well, let's let's uh, do a home renovation. That takes time to, to work out. We also know that sometimes uh, inflation dynamics are quite gradual, uh, which is definitely true at the moment. And that's why we are patient in hitting our target. In other times, inflation dynamics can be quite intense. And so the medium term, I think, is a, an appropriate formulation. It conveys that it's not overnight, but it conveys the urgency is that it's not 10 years from now we care about. And that's why you need the patience. But turning a bit back to the, the ECB then, that you, we, we talked already about how global central banks all converge around this roughly 2% mm. inflation objective. Um, at the ECB, of course, we have the, 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 the treaty defines our, our mandate as price stability. Uh, the ECB's governing council then at some point decided that was close to but below 2%. Um, how does that evolve over time? Is there anything that needs to change there? There's been talk by President uh, Mario Draghi about um, some kind of review of the of the framework coming up. How do you see this, and and you know to what extent should we be um, adjusting what we're doing? So uh, the last major review of the target was uh, in 2003, which is 16 years ago. So I think uh, any organization probably wants to review its strategy uh, more frequently than that. Now, there are good reasons why there's been a delay. I mean, most obviously, the global crisis that really kicked off in 07 and 08 has meant there were other priorities. I mean, if to be honest, I mean, I think uh, for a long time, that formulation of close to but below 2% was essentially so close to 2% that maybe it didn't matter. 
Uh, so when, for example, the Federal Reserve adopted 2% in 2012. Uh, is there a big difference between saying our target is 2 versus saying our target is below but close to 2? I think that's something for a review to reflect upon. Pro but I think it's, it cannot be doubted. Uh, any difference between those formulations is more salient when you have inflation below target. Because the question is, what is enough? It made sense at the time. So the founding fathers uh, of the euro area, the, the imperative in the early years of the euro was to make sure everyone understood that inflation above 2% would not be tolerated. Because, of course, many countries had a history of high inflation. So the formulation at that time, I think, uh, sent a good signal that we really want inflation uh, not to exceed 2 Right now, the bigger issue I think now is convincing everyone that inflation will return to the target. Uh, whether you're hitting a target of close to but below 2% or be more precise about a 2% target, that is something worth discussing in a, in a review. Philip, thank you very much for joining okay. us. Uh, my, my pleasure. Our next guests are Christiana Nickel and Frank Smets. Christiana and her team are in charge of monitoring and analysing inflation and wage developments in the euro area. She's done a lot of research on the causes of low inflation and low wage growth, but also on structural drivers of inflation like demography and globalisation. Frank has worked at the ECB for over 20 years in a number of senior positions, including time as an advisor to President Mario Draghi. He now manages the teams in charge of forecasting economic developments and policies, and he even has an inflation model named after him. This work involves monitoring and analysing inflation data and advising the ECB's governing council on monetary policy decisions. Now, in the previous conversation, we already mentioned that inflation is obviously at the very core of what we do as a central bank. But what does it mean in practice? So, Christian, if I can turn to you to start with, can you tell us a little bit about how price developments are measured and how does this translate into defining monetary policy? Now, in the euro area, we measure this consumer price inflation by the Harmonized Index of Consumer Prices, the HICP. And the term harmonized denotes the fact that all the countries in the European Union follow the same methodology. This ensures that the data for one country can be compared with the data for another. This HICP is not calculated by us, by the ECB, but by the National Statistical Institutes for each euro area country, and it's later on then added up also by Eurostat. Now, when you look at what is covered by this HICP, it is exactly like this idea of going to the supermarket and shop for a basket of goods. It measures the average change over time in the prices paid by households for a specific, regularly updated basket of consumer goods and services. So who decides what's in the basket? It's basically the National Statistical Institutes that decide what is representative also for their country, and they regularly update this basket of goods so that it basically stays also up to date with latest developments in how also consumer behavior changes. Okay, so the different countries might have slightly different baskets. Yes, but still it's harmonized in the sense that the, each country doesn't deviate too much, let's say, from the common standard that we have for the whole of the European Union. And crucially, not done by us, so we're not sort of marking our own homework. No. Exactly. Now, maybe turning to Frank, Philip Lane touched on the point that prices have been rising a bit more slowly in the past years. Um, what actually makes the prices rise in the first place and why has inflation been so low recently? Well, there are many factors that uh, can lead to rising wages and prices. And probably the most popular framework to explain changes in inflation is, is the so-called Phillips curve. This is a, a model that was named after Professor Phillips, who was an economist at the London School of Economics in the 1950s, who at that time noted a clear negative relationship between unemployment and wage inflation. So when few people are looking for work and the labor market is tight, then, uh, it, then the employers have to raise wages to attract those workers, and inflation is high. And the reverse, if unemployment is high, the ability of workers to demand higher wages will be limited and inflation will be low. Remember, unemployment in the euro area was more than 12% at its peak in 2013, and that put downward pressure on wages and inflation. But then, as the economy recovered, partly also because of the stimulus 
uh, by the central bank. People get employed and unemployment fell to levels that are now close to where they were uh, before the crisis. And so also wages and prices started to recover. And so wage inflation now is basically back to average levels. What's still missing a little bit is uh, price inflation. So the pass-through from wages to inflation has been a bit slower than uh, usually. There is a debate about whether the Phillips curve is dead, which is a, a vibrant debate in the academic literature. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you can look at uh, an inflation conference that Christiana organized a couple of weeks ago. And two of the keynote speakers came with a definite answer that, at least in the euro area, the Phillips curve is uh, alive and, and kicking. And therefore, we're also quite confident that as the economy further recovers and, and continues to grow, inflation will eventually also converge to two uh, percent. So there's a, there's a there's a process here. We had the crisis. We had huge unemployment. Unemployment has now been going down a lot. That means that wages have started to go up, and now you would expect prices to to come up afterwards. Is that is that a fair? Summary? Yes. Now, of course, there there are other factors also that determine inflation, and uh, that's some of these factors have actually put the lid on on inflation. One very important one is oil prices, because that uh, is a very volatile. Uh, price, which is basically determined in international commodity markets, but has a direct impact on the cost of energy. And so that is another factor that has actually had a downward impact on uh, inflation over the past uh, three to four years, particularly because, um, of course, there are demand and supply factors in, in the oil market, but the, the new technologies such as fracking technology has actually increased the supply of oil and put down put the price. Uh, the price. Down. Yeah. And of course, everyone needs energy to heat their houses or move around for transport and so on. So that's why that's such a big factor. Yes, it, it's one of the bigger components in, in the price index that uh, Christiana mentioned there's some other things at work here, aren't there, Christiana, like um, the so-called structural factors where we start talking about things like globalization, uh, aging populations, uh, and, and even e-commerce. Um, can you talk us through some of those aspects and some of the work that you've done? I mean, most importantly, I would like to say up front that still what Frank just mentioned, you know, the drivers of the Phillips curve are still, I think, the m most important way of explaining inflation as we see it today. However, there are these other factors that you mentioned, these structural uh, factors in addition to the cyclical factors. For example, you have um, e-commerce and digitalization that have become much more important in recent years. So, for example, digitalization poses a challenge to the measurement of inflation. Just think of Netflix or Spotify and these new offers replace the traditional products like CDs and DVDs. Now, with these new products, it's, of course, difficult um, to know what will be the weight in the basket. And it is also difficult to know exactly how to basically price these new products. It's just an example of how difficult it is to really keep this uh, basket basically up to date. And if you look at the rise of e-commerce and online shopping, we also know uh, that nowadays it's much easier to compare prices with each other because you know what is online and you can actually also go to the supermarket or to the shop and negotiate for your price and with this kind of competition actually also put a, basically a lid on how much prices can adjust. Because that's people literally standing in the shop with their smartphone exactly. saying to the shopkeeper, look, I can get this from here yeah, for this. Yeah. Will you match the price? And exactly, then, okay. exactly. And these are kind of indirect effects of, of e-commerce or digitalization. And they are also difficult to measure, let's say, by the usual way we have our harmonized index of consumer prices and that we normally look at. We find overall that there has been a small negative effect of e-commerce on inflation but this effect is hard to pin down using only the data that is at an aggregated level and this is why we also have efforts in the ECB to actually look at more disaggregated data and data that in particular comes from the internet. Aging populations, why, why would that have an effect on inflation? We've seen that the structure of the of the uh, of the population has very much changed in the large the last forty years, and um, and if if you look at population aging, one example that springs to mind is Japan, um, where quite a number of studies have pointed out that demographics 
Olympics has been a deflationary force. And if you look at the demographic developments in Europe, we see that there is a positive long-run relationship between inflation and the growth rate of the working age population. Now, why is that? One reason is, for example, or could be, that indeed, let's say, the savings behavior of people has changed. Because you know that you live longer, you also save more. And spend and less. And spend less. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, has then an impact also on inflation at the aggregate. But I just wanted to, to point out that with demographics, we are still, let's say, at the very early stages of, of research. The jury is still out because, of course, demographics is a development that is very slow, therefore not easy to capture, like in frameworks, like in the Phillips curve. Um, and we also know that we will move to a new equilibrium with demographics. So at some point, this impact that we see may actually come to an end or may not be as uh, strong as we maybe see it at the moment. So tell us a little bit about globalization. How, does, how is that affecting uh, uh, inflation, around, in, particularly in the euro area? We have seen more globalization and integration in global value change, and this might increase the dependence of domestic inflation on global developments. For example, if you look at global value chains, we know that nowadays companies can produce their inputs all across the world. And if a, co a company in Germany sees that it can get its imported goods from somewhere else or can produce in a different production facility somewhere else in the world, it basically gets the input then from the cheapest possible country. That, of course, will also reduce costs and eventually might also lead to lower costs in the production um, of this good. So we've seen that the, 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 these, these are all big changes, big structural changes. Now, a phrase that you sometimes hear or read is this thing about new normal. Um, does that mean that lower inflation is the new normal? No, I think many of these structural changes are one-off changes that have persistent but uh, typically temporary effects uh, on inflation. Christiana, anything to add to that? I would say that, as Frank already mentioned, um, these are long run, but also uh, drivers that eventually should lead to some kind of new equilibrium. So, for example, e-commerce is a factor where not every shop will close just because it's, there's online uh, pricing. We've seen it in the US that there has been a rather strong impact of online purchases in the past, but this effect has been slowing down. So, in other words, it just needs a bit more patience um, so that we basically see that eventually also inflation uh, may rise again. So turning back to the ECB and, and particularly your two jobs, and I think it'd be this is a great moment uh, since we've got you on the podcast to ask you about this. One of, one of the things that the ECB obviously does to when it's trying to set monetary policy is to uh, forecast or project where inflation is going to go. Um, you're both closely involved in that whole exercise. Can you talk us through that a little bit? Uh, yes, uh, we produce basically uh, forecasts for economic growth, inflation, employment, wages and a whole host of uh, economic and macroeconomic variables four times a year, typically in March, June, September and December. Um, these uh, Twice a year, these forecasts are actually done by the national central banks and the role of the ECB is to basically aggregate, give feedback and aggregate the numbers in a euro area uh, forecast. That's in June and, and December. And twice a year, it's basically an update that is being done by the ECB itself, again, in consultation with uh, the national central banks, because, of course, those uh, central banks have a, a lot of the intimate knowledge of, of, of their economy, which uh, improves our analysis and, and our forecasts. The horizon of our forecasts, uh, of our macroeconomic projections, as we call them, is between two and three years. And the further away it is, the harder it is. I mean, to, to be a bit mean, I mean, we're often criticized for getting them wrong. I think that's a, 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 the same for, for all forecasters everywhere. But so can you explain a bit the, the difficulty in, in this exercise? 
Well, I mean, that's, that's of course, the difficulty of any forecast. Um, and there's basically two main sources of uh, the forecast errors that we make. I mean, the first source is that, I mean, the economy is subject to news and shocks all the time. And by definition, news is not forecastable. So if uh, there's no developments on trade tariffs in the trade war, that can have an impact on, on the economy through the effect of uncertainty on investment and on trade and basically lead our forecast to, of, of, of inflation to, to fall. Now, as long as we don't have that news, we can't really tell that uh, this effect uh, will be there. So there's a lot of uncertainty about those shocks that affect this. Another example is oil prices. Uh, if uh, a war starts in the Middle East, then that immediately has an impact on, on oil prices. Oil prices will increase and that will have an effect on, uh, on, on energy prices and, and, and inflation. So that's, that's uh, probably the most important source when we try to decompose why do we make errors? It's often because we haven't foreseen what happened to energy prices or food prices, which are very volatile and respond to factors we cannot forecast, such as the weather, for example. The other part is, and this comes back to the previous discussion, that of course the way the economy works changes all the time. And of course, when we do a forecast, we look at the data and we use our models, macroeconometric models, to uh, interpret those data and forecast uh, what will uh, happen to economic growth and, and inflation. Now, these models are based on historical regularities. They are estimated on the past. And of course, the future doesn't have to be uh, like the past, as we've discussed. Globalization has changed some of the effects of uh, imported uh, inflation. Uh, similarly, e-commerce -com has an impact on how firms uh, set their prices. And so in our forecasting process, we have to uh, continuously update uh, our models in order to, to sort of keep track of the changing uh, economy. Actually, that's one of the reasons why uh, the third important element of any forecast is judgment. That's really all the information that we cannot capture by the standard data or by the standard models. And that's nevertheless important in uh, uh, forming a view of uh, on the inflation outlook. Why is it so important as a central bank that we're doing these forecasts and that we're getting them as accurate as we can? Well, the forecasts are uh, a summary of uh, the inflation outlook and the economic outlook uh, of the euro area and therefore a very important input for the monetary policy deliberations of the governing council. And forecasts are important because, as, as we mentioned before, monetary policy works with a lag. When the uh, governing council uh, reduces the interest rate now, then this has an impact on growth uh, a year out and on inflation two to three years out. So in order to stabilize inflation, we need to know what inflation, what our view is on inflation two to three years out. Uh, and that is really uh, given by the forecast. Okay, great. Well, Frank, Christiana, good luck with the uh, uh, ongoing, challenging uh, role that you have. And thanks a lot for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you. That's just about it for this episode. It's been fascinating to hear from my expert guests, Philip Lane, Christiana Nickel, and Frank Smets. We're working hard at the ECB trying to keep inflation in that Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, neither too low nor too high. And we've discussed a little bit how this all works in practice, what inflation means to you, how price developments are measured, and the structural issues that can make it such a tricky job. Do also look in the show notes for links to relevant papers and publications from the ECB. And if you have any thoughts on this episode or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover in future episodes, you can get in touch with us on social media via direct messages and comments. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Michael Steen. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.